We are seekers on a quest to discover truth and meaning. Sometimes we think we've found it wrapped up, glimmering with newness straight off the intellectual assembly line. All the answers right here for us and others, if they would only listen. But truth has a way of coming in disguise, sometimes wearing rags and sometimes finery, but so often cloaked from our immediate sight. And sometimes that which we have rejected and that which we have let go of or decided was only for others but not for us can be our teacher. Let our time of worship be an acknowledgement of the never-ending journey toward truth and meaning and our appreciation of those we learn from along the way. Those opening words by Jason Cook. And I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join in singing number 40, 40 in the gray book, The Morning Hangs a Signal. Would our chalice lighter come forward, please, to light the chalice and lead us in the words. The Mortlands.
Let this flame be to us a symbol of the wholeness we seek. Its brightness dispelling gloom, lighting a path to faith and hope. Its glow reminding us of the sacred bonds that link us to all living things. Its radiance calling us to cast the light of freedom, justice, and peace upon all the world. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome. I'm the Reverend Susan Milner. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and it is my honor and my pleasure to serve as interim minister to this congregation. We gratefully acknowledge the Patuxic Wampanoag people on whose ancestral lands we gather today. We commit to support and honor their history and their culture. We welcome all of you members and friends, newcomers, visitors today, whoever you are, wherever you are on your journey, whatever your age, young or middle or older, for this one hour, we want you to feel part of this congregation and to feel like there is a place for you. We are glad that you're here. Everyone is invited, as usual, to coffee hour following the service in the assembly hall that's through this door, through the parlor, and at that end of the building. And if you are new here, if you're willing to take one of those red mugs on the coffee hour, then we will be able to notice you and try to give you a warm first parish greeting. I have one announcement, and then um, uh, Cindy Ladvirini has one. So, Cindy, maybe you could be coming up to the mic as I uh, remind you the next Sunday is Easter and that there is a tradition that I can't wait to see in this congregation, because I've never seen it before, of the egg tree. And everyone's invited to bring a decorated egg to hang on that tree if you would like to. Uh, they started, I understand, as, and some of them are blown eggs where you blow, I, I don't know how to do that, but um, a decorated egg. Please, please add yours to the, to the hole next week. Cindy? Yeah, good morning. Uh, Cindy Ladd Fiorini, I'm president of your governing board. We are in the process of uh, just beginning to put a ministerial search committee together, one of the most important committees we're going to be having in the next year or so. Um, some of you, um, by asking, have already um, submitted to um, the office uh, suggestions for nominations. And if you haven't done so, but you would like to, um, <clears throat> you can either send me an email. Don't tell me at coffee hour because I won't remember, <laughs> um, but send me an email or send an email to Lenore in the church office um, with suggestions that you might have of think people that you think would be um, good members of the search committee, members that the congregation will get behind and trust, um, and we are looking for some diversity of, of all kinds. Thank you. I'm Rudy Langner. I'm currently on the Board of Trustees, and I just want to make an announcement about members and friends um, of the church who have college-age uh, children or grandchildren. Um, the church has some resources available in the form of a scholarship or, and or a loan, um, and I'm the contact person. So uh, it's going to be in the bell ringer next week. But if anybody has any interest in that, I'll be at coffee hour and I can provide more information. Thank you. Good 
Good morning. My name is Julie Lillies, and I'm a, a member of the fellowship committee. Just a quick uh, request. If anybody has any of the yellow tablecloths at home getting washed, if you could bring them back. We have a number of events coming up. Thank you. Okay. Seems to be announcements. I know, right? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I am warning our church to do what we can to um, save our democracy in the November election. So I have a list in the coffee hour. <clears throat> if you would be willing to sign up to write postcards as the election comes nearer to swing states, and they would be nonpartisan, but they would be effective. So um, please see my little display and sign up. Thanks. And thanks for those who already have. And now we are, there are a lot of things planned for our kids downstairs, so we're going to sing them out to go now in peace and wish them a really full and rewarding Sunday, rest of the Sunday morning. And Tom Mortland is going to introduce the share of the plate offering for this month. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is Tom Mortland, and I'm a disabled veteran. I'm a member of this church, and today I'm speaking about the Disabled Veterans Organization, also known in short, the DAV. The DAV was started during World War I and is the oldest, largest veteran service organization in America. The DAV has local chapters, which are part of a state and national organization, with over 50 chapters in Massachusetts alone. The closest one to us is in Marshfield in Brant Rock. The DAV fills in gaps in many veterans' needs without discrimination that the U.S. Veterans Administration does not cover, such as free transportation, meals, housing, scholarships, and recreation. The DAV links veterans to job training and assists in the job search. Veteran suicides are at an all-time high, and the DAV and the Veterans Administration are there to counsel and affirm veterans' self-worth, dignity, and to promote a positive future for each veteran. DAV personnel are mostly volunteer veterans. Their participation gives them and the disabled vets they interact with fellowship, camaraderie, bonding, lasting relationships, and a purpose. The DAV fulfills its promise to disabled vets every day. Local DAV chapters provide free meals for veterans on all major holidays and for homeless veterans. They assist in services such as grocery shopping, yard work, hospital assistance, and many other tasks. The DAV promotes justice for veterans, such as VA coverage for Agent Orange exposure, poison water at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and several other serious injury claims with state and federal government. The DAV has a high efficiency rating, with 86% of the contribution goes directly to the veterans and 14% for administration. The military-civilian divide has been wide and heartbreaking. Some of you may not understand what veterans went through because you weren't there. Let's give our veterans a shot at coming home by extending a helping hand 
with a donation. You will be helping fulfill the national responsibility of care for veterans and may inspire other Americans as well. Thank you. Once a month, we take the opportunity to hear from you as you light a candle, if you choose, uh, a joy or a concern. If you have one you want to share today, please tell us your name and um, state it very briefly. official adoption day, which he refer refers to as his judge day, is coming up on Thursday. I want to light a very different candle. Um, a friend of Rick's and I, um, long-term Duxbury resident, long-term friends of ours died suddenly um, of a heart attack uh, Thursday morning. And um, so this is for David Seeger. concern for Jean Baker, a longtime member of the congregation who fell about 10 days ago in her residence at the village. Uh, she's after some time at uh, uh, BID South, you know, but I can't even remember what it used to be called now. Uh, she's now at uh, Bay Path uh, and for an indeterminate but hopefully short stay. Uh, and I think we'd suggest that maybe a note to her uh, at her address at the village would be uh, uh, encouraging to her and might lift her spirits a bit, which have been um, low since the fall. Um, not recommending visits particularly to, to Bay Path at the moment for her, um, if that changes, um, or if you have an interest, just uh, let Sherry or could wish uh, or could uh, get a friendly note from you all. Thanks. Hi, my name is Doug Friesen. Um, this is a candle of both joy and sorrow for my good friend Rita Ranks who uh, died a little earlier this year and she was born with polio and uh, didn't walk really until she was a teenager and then went on to live a life of travel and adventure that most of us could only dream of and as well as creating a clothing manufacture and design business in Bali, Indonesia and importing the clothes to Canada. And uh, she chose to uh, end her life by physician assistance earlier this year because it had 
become too painful for her to go on. And uh, I'm going to be traveling to Edmonton, Alberta this weekend for her memorial service. So my thoughts are with her. Mike Wilson, this is a candle of concern for my sister Tracy, who uh, after surgery on Monday, she's been fighting melanoma for the last six years, uh, ended up <clears throat> back in the hospital on Wednesday, and she's doing okay, but struggling. One candle for the joys and sorrows and concerns that go unspoken here in this room this morning. Oh, I should ask, do we have any from folks on Zoom, um, Ted? Any joys and sorrows? I can light a candle if anybody has one. Barbara, would you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. Would you light a candle in remembrance of my dear friend, Trudy Babbitt, who passed away at age 89 this week? I didn't hear us. For a, a light a candle for whom? Trudy Babbitt. A dear friend who passed For Trudy away. Babbitt. Any others, Ted? All right, and then the one candle I lit for everything that goes unspoken, but that you are, are people carrying with them this morning. Would you join, please, in a spirit of prayer, meditation, attention. Spirit of life and love, we gather in this community grateful for its presence, for the generations that have come before and will follow after, grateful to for the tradition that holds our doubts and our questions, as well as our discoveries and our convictions. The tradition that calls from us both fierce love for truth and justice and tender love for one another. Amid the distractions and decisions and inevitable labor of our life, here together, may we be mindful of the depth of human longing and the shared humanity that brings us here and inspire us to share our thoughts, to find our answers, to forgive each other our imperfections and find our way forward. May our hearts go out to the many who are suffering in this world just now. In that spirit, let us dwell alone together as we enter into the silence.
are starting to think very seriously about the ministerial search and one thing that I do in an interim from time to time in different settings is to share with you some of what I think is compelling to ministers as they look at congregations and think where they might do ministry. And I know that even when I am in a search for an interim ministry, it is important to me whether a congregation does share the plate. That's something that I always notice and that's always a positive. It always registers in the positive column. So I'm very grateful this morning to serve a congregation again that does that. And you certainly have a worthy cause before you this month with the Veterans Organization. I think we all felt how heartfelt Tom's words were. So please, in support of a, of a community that is willing to share in generosity and in support of our veterans, please give as generously as you can. The morning offering will now be given and gratefully received. In the Christian world, today's Palm Sunday begins Holy Week. The moments and the stories 
or writings about that that um, touch me most are the very human moments, such as the very down-to-earth ones, uh, such as this one that Mary Oliver imagines in the poet thinks about the donkey. On the outskirts of Jerusalem, the donkey waited, not especially brave or filled with understanding. He stood and waited. How horses turned out into the meadow leap with delight. How doves released from cages clatter away splashed with sunlight. But the donkey, tied to a tree as usual, waited. Then he let himself be led away. Then he let the stranger mount. Never had he seen such crowds. And I wonder if he had all imagined what was to happen. Still, he was what he had always been, small, dark, obedient. I hope finally he felt brave. I hope finally he loved the man who rode so lightly upon him as he lifted one dusty hoof and stepped as he had to, forward. Twelve years ago, bones believed to be those of King Richard III were detected under a car park in Leicester, England. Excitement was fierce. News coverage rippled with a sense that some truth, some enduring truth about this shadowed figure from more than 500 years ago might surface along with whatever lay under the earth and concrete. Archaeologists excavated the bones which were carbon dated and DNA analyzed and sure enough they registered the right age and the DNA proved a near perfect match to a Canadian descendant of the York King. Richard III's skeleton had been found, studied, and now given burial appropriate, burial appropriate to an English monarch. And still, 
various images of Richard, Shakespeare's evil, manipulative, murderous villain, an effective king whose reign brought the jury trial and aid for peasants, the fighter who fell in the last battle of the War of the Roses. All of those images still spoke to people as they would after the excavation of his last earthly remains, there was no one true Richard III that everyone agreed on. And so it goes not because history is weak, but because human imagination and perception are strong. Where human beings can tell stories, we will where we can find guidelines or wisdom or worse ideologies and justifications for our worst impulses, we will. We will form loyalties that tap our own longings and help us manage our own fears or that grow out of our own prejudices. Inspiration will come where it does because spirit is by its nature unpredictable and unscripted. And so with that understanding, perhaps we can enter in our own Unitarian, Universalist way, the holiest week of the year for the Christian world, which starts today. Or perhaps I should say Christian worlds, because that of a Catholic Church driven to confront Oppression through liberation theology in Peru is very different from that of an evangelical Protestant church in South Carolina driven to save individual souls for the pearly gates. Regardless of the tradition, at the center is the figure of Jesus, the teacher, as I like to refer to him, whose short life and even shorter ministry hide, they hide, layered under centuries of civilizations and patriarchal power structures, misunderstanding and sheer misery. And here we are, here we are as Unitarian Universalists growing out of and away from that reforming Protestantism and grappling always with who we take the teacher to be. The Unitarian part of our tradition, we say, has long been more inspired by the way Jesus lived than the way he died. We have been more informed by his teachings than the theologies that grew through centuries of institutional religion and were layered on top, layer after layer of whatever it was that happened those millennia ago. In fact, 19th and 20th century Unitarianism, early Unitarianism, was often said to be the religion of Jesus, not the religion about Jesus. And there's something clean and rational and comforting about that iteration, isn't there? Almost as if Jesus must have had a degree from a certified theological institution. But then you run into the questions, which teachings and rendered by whom? I knew, and I suspect this is not an unusual experience here, I knew when I was pretty young that the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, who really did appear in my Southern Baptist Sunday School books, and who was there to save me from a hell my Universalist even then soul did not believe in, that one failed to inspire me. When it came to religion, I sort of grew up feeling strangely of being on the outside looking on, not even in, just looking on. I was more befuddled years later when the mystical Jesus 
of the Gospel of John alive with spirit and taught by the respected, passionate teacher Henry Nowen in divinity school when I was there left me feeling on the outside as well. No matter how much I studied, how much I read, I didn't connect. I couldn't quite find the truth. And here's the thing. Look as hard as you can. Excavate using all the tools of scholarship, meditation, prayer available. Read, reread, read some more, and you will find it hard, in all honesty, to say there is any one teacher. We find the humble Jesus who washes his disciples' feet and cares for the most marginalized, but also in one of my favorite stories in Mark, my favorite gospel, the angry Jesus, hungry and frustrated in that last week, the Jesus who approaches a fig tree that has no fruit and curses the tree, which withers within hours. The human Jesus. And there's the Jesus who lifts up prostitutes and encourages women followers, as you can find very few places in literature, myth of that time. But then there's the Jesus who teaches in parables that sometimes leave you, or I should say leave me, feeling I could never live up to those high standards. But you know what? That uncertainty should not surprise us. Everything we know supposedly, and question marks about Jesus, the stories, the teachings, the metaphors, were put on paper many years after he died. The earliest of the four Gospels, Mark, appeared at least 66 years later after his death, and the last John a century or more later. How much storytelling and dreaming and controversial wrangling and strategizing happened in between. How can it all be excavated? Imagine, what if nothing had been published of the speeches or life events of Martin Luther King Jr. for 60 years after his death, which would be in 2028? Even with real time film and recordings, we have several different images of King from a reluctant activist who was persuaded to be a leader in the Montgomery boycott to an impatient prophet who grew weary of waiting on white people to act and waiting and waiting. And so how else could it be for the understanding of a charismatic leader resting under 2,000 years of patriarchal religion and personal projection by everyone. In all of this uncertainty, it's important to realize this. Which version of the teacher or of Martin Luther King or of any other iconic, transformative figure which speaks to us says more about us than it might about the person. It's a matter of which transformation we long for, which wisdom grounds us as mortal creatures. If we know what we're searching for, if we know what we're rejecting, we can be more open to a truth that is whole and nuanced dusty, shady. We might even find a version of the teacher that speaks to us. For me, the moment came when I encountered the work of Marcus Borg and Dominique Crossan of the Jesus Seminar, the historical Jesus. They dug through centuries of decaying theologies and researched historical context to reveal an activist leader. He was a teacher, yes in a compassionate presence who sought not only to heal individuals but also to transform the life collectively of his people for the better. Now think about the context of what's observed now 
at least from the stories on this Sunday, it was a busy time in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, a time of the year when people came for rituals and celebrations. But every year, you know who else came? The Roman occupiers. Because they were afraid of what happens when crowds of oppressed people gather. People whose land had been taken, whose religion had been put off limits in many ways. And this one year they were very anxious for a wildly popular itinerant teacher and healer was traveling 150 miles from Galilee with a dangerous ability to inspire people. The teacher urged his people to throw off the yoke of Roman oppression, to hold as the highest value their teachings that honored the poor and the humble. And the more marginalized people he held in compassion, the more disabled people that he urged to believe in themselves, the more he exposed Roman exploitation of the poor, the more threatening he became. Like Martin Luther King Jr. who traveled to Memphis in solidarity with striking sanitation workers knowing he could die, being very overtly threatened. The teacher went to Jerusalem realizing he was marked. And on that day, Pontius Pilate rode through the main gates of the city on horseback with his legion of soldiers with heavy armor and weapons on full display, daring anyone not to bow to the power of empire. But on the other side of town in the East Gate came the peasant teacher on the humble donkey that Mary Oliver reminds us of. And he was surrounded by other peasants, spreading their cloaks and palm branches, shouting, Hosanna, which means peace. In that week to come, he did everything to fly in the face of the oppressors from going to the temple, which he wasn't supposed to do, to overturning the money tables, to gathering his disciples in a community meal. For his three years of activism, this week we know he was arrested, he was tried, he was condemned, and he was put to death through crucifixion, which was a form of execution reserved by the Roman state for traitors and insurrectionists. Margus Borg articulates the importance of this teacher. The point is not that Jesus was a good guy who accepted everybody and thus we should do the same, though that would be good. Rather, his teachings and behavior reflect an alternative social vision. Jesus was not talking about how to be good and how to behave within the framework of a domination system. He was a critic of the system itself. I admire Jesus, the compassionate healer. I'm curious about the Jesus with a strong sense of connection to the divine, which I don't quite understand. I reject any untethered Jesus misused to justify racism or prosperity privilege. But Jesus the activist, the prophet, touched me here because of my own experience. That teacher would have joined the civil rights protest of my growing up. It defined my growing up. He would have understood my father walking on the picket line for the Southern Railway to try to secure health insurance. He would have had compassion for a whole generation, part of a generation of young people needing to believe the world can be a better place for those who are cast aside and that we can make it so. He would have cared about the veterans who have put everything on the line for what they believed in. And for a while, I wanted to believe that was the 
teacher of the text, the only one, but it's so much more complicated than that. What I can say is that the acts of leaders like that teacher or like MLK or like Sojourner Truth or like Alexei Navalny teach me what I care about, what I would under certain circumstances. I hope, put my life on the line for. And that, that's the most reliable truth buried deep that I have to keep excavating over and over with every challenge that our troubled world presents. Would you rise and body or spirit and let's join in singing number 123 in the great book twice through Spirit of Life. Go in hope, for the arc of the universe is long, and we can bend it toward justice. Go in courage, for together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and the larger world. Go in love, because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform our lives. The words of one.